Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of Sight for White and White Sense, welcoming you to this week's Talking News. Today is Friday, the 22nd of March 2024, and I come to you from the Snowdone in Hemel Hempstead. My, how times have changed. I'm here because my son has to do his GCSE assessment in snowboarding. I'm quite certain when I was at school, we couldn't do a GCSE in snowboarding. Anyway, it's pretty cold in here, so I hope that my voice is crystal clear for people to hear. To be quite honest, it's all a bit bizarre. I have to film him to give the evidence to the school. So, of course, I have absolutely no idea which is my child on the slopes. So I'm basically got one camera on my chest, one camera on my head, and one camera on my hand. And I'm hoping that one of the three cameras picks up the right child. Thank you to everybody who came to the White Sense members feedback and catch up last Wednesday on the 20th. And a reminder that the Site for White one will be taking place during the coffee morning this Wednesday on the 27th. We will aim to start it before the coffee morning, but we will let people gather and those who want to join in can and those who don't, no problem at all. But in principle, the meeting will be during the coffee morning on the 27th this Wednesday coming. Everybody stay safe. Thank you, Lisa. Here is this week's charity news for the week beginning Monday 22nd of March. Swimming is on Monday between 1.15 and 2.15pm at Medina Leisure Centre, Newport. The cost is £6 plus transport. We have the whole use of the pool and you can enjoy lane swimming or just gentle relaxation in the water. Yoga is on Tuesday at Millbrook House between 1.45 and 2.45pm. The cost is £4 and includes refreshments. All are welcome. Our weekly coffee and chat is on Wednesday at Millbrook House between 10am and 11.30am. The cost is £2, which includes coffee and cake. Staff are always on hand to help with any inquiries and equipment will be available to try out. During our coffee and chat, we will be having our Sight for White quarterly feedback and catch-up. Please come along and bring any question you have about the charity or any feedback you wish to share. Wednesday afternoon, we welcome Braiding Roman Villa to our Eye on Social group. This is open to everyone and starts at 2pm. The cost is £3, which includes refreshments. You are welcome to bring family, friends and neighbours. Thursday is Mix and Mingle. This group meets between 10.30am and 2pm every week. Booking for this group is essential and at the moment there is a waiting list for people to join. Due to the Easter Bank holidays, the office will be closed from Thursday 4pm until Tuesday the 2nd at 9am. Everyone have a lovely Easter and hopefully enjoy some sunshine. We still have spaces available for the pottery on April the 20th at Jubilee Stores Newport. The cost is £25. Our knitted Easter egg covers are selling fast, so if you haven't purchased yours yet, please do to avoid disappointment. They are on sale at Millbrook, Forest View Nurseries, The Sloop in Wooden, Bryston Village Shop and of course our Dress for Less shop in Newport for the suggested donation price of £2. Our monthly 100 club has spare balls available. If anyone would like to buy a ball it is £2 per month or £24 for the full year. The more balls in draw the higher the prize money each month. If you would like to take part in our monthly draw please call the office. This is part of our fundraising activities. If you would like to join any activity or want more details, please call the office on 522205. This is Michael reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Mermaid Gin Ride Arena plans on ice due to lack of maintenance. Lack of maintenance at the former Ride Arena ice rink caused the business behind Mermaid Gin to withdraw from major development plans, an Isle of Wight councillor has claimed. Councillor Michael Lilly of Ride Community Trust, and who will represent the Liberal Democrats 
in the Isle of Wight East at the next general election, asked a question at the Isle of Wight Council's Cabinet meeting last week. He asked what action the Isle of Wight Council plans to take over what he called a lack of maintenance on the major building on Ride Seafront. He said lack of maintenance was why Isle of Wight Distillery pulled out from the process to turn the building into an attraction and distillery hub. When Isle of Wight Distillery withdrew its plans, it did not explain why and has not commented on Councillor Lilly's suggestion that the condition of the building was to blame. Leaseholders of Ride Arena, AEW, not to be confused with the wrestling company of the same acronym, said it will continue to maintain the condition of the property in accordance with its leasehold obligations while it works on future plans for the building. Leader of the Isle of Wight Council, Councillor Phil Jordan, said the lease requires the arena structure to be well maintained and that County Hall is working with AEW to see what repairs and maintenance might be required and practical to undertake. The freehold is owned by the council, but since 2014, the lease has been in the hands of the multinational investment firm AEW. The building has been empty since 2016, when the once popular and much used ice rink, formerly Planet Ice, closed. The Isle of Wight Council has tried to take AEW to court to try to get the building back, but the arbitration proceedings came to an end in 2021 before an agreement could be reached. At the time, the council reaffirmed its commitment to resolving the arena's future and said it would not accept proposals to replace the ice rink with retail. Ride Arena once housed the Isle of Wight's Raiders ice hockey team and numerous ice skating groups, and its disuse has forced many to travel to the mainland to practice and compete. Hopes for an ice rink on the island were raised when in recent years, with plans approved for such a facility next to Smallbrook Stadium, but no work has been done since planning permission was approved. This is Petrina reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Mutton Chop, former Newport pub and eyesore site to be make way for housing. An eyesore site in the heart of Newport could be bought by the Isle of Wight Council to make way for housing. Land on Pyle Street and East Street has been empty for years after buildings, including the former shoulder of Mutt Pub and houses, were pulled down. The council fears if it does not buy the 0.5 acre site from Homes, England, someone else will, an opportunist developer, which may not enhance his key location on delivering housing, it said. A study conducted by the authority last month said there is the space to provide 40 homes, a ground floor commercial or community unit and on-site parking. Of the one and two bed homes, 14 could be affordable properties. A decision will be made by the authority later this month about whether to buy the site or not. The authority has been able to secure £409,360 funding from the government to make the site suitable for redevelopment, including clearing, levelling and removing materials. However, the site must be sold to the council before the end of March so it can use the government cash. The cost of developing the proposed scheme will be more than £494,500, the councillor said, but the 40 residential and mixed unit potential is seen as both viable and will be able to secure planning permission. The government funding is key to ensuring it could be developed, though, 
the council said. The actual price the council could buy the land for is confidential, but the council may pay £14,000 in legal fees. However, the authority has said the purchase price and holding cost for the site are sufficiently low that buying it now and taking time to bring the right development forward would be preferable to risking someone else acquiring it, mitigating both of these risks. Permission was granted in 2006 for the buildings on the land to be knocked down and a block of 69 flats to be built. While the buildings were demolished in the subsequent years, no block of flax appeared and the land has been left in a derelict state. The site is currently owned by Homes England, which bought it in 2016 as a regeneration opportunity, but was never developed due to viability issues, the council has said. This article from Isle of Wight Radio, read by Howard, concerns current scams on the island. Trading Standards is reporting a mix of old and new scams for islanders to be aware of this week. The most recent scams reported by island residents are listed below. 1. The Inheritance Letter. There's been a report of a scam inheritance letter circulating. The letter states a person has died and left a will and the supposed solicitors are trying to find someone with the same surname to inherit. If you contact the sender, they'll undoubtedly request that you send money to release the funds. You will never need to send money to release money. They can take any payments from your inheritance if it's genuine. Two, TV licensing scam. The TV licensing scam is doing the rounds again. If you're unsure if it's genuine, contact TV licensing independently. Never click on links in messages. Three, condensation scam. We've received reports of scam phone calls about condensation in homes. These are variations on common scam calls that will try to facilitate a visit from a surveyor who will undoubtedly find damp and then try to carry out unnecessary work on your property for thousands of pounds. Don't engage with any call that purports to relate to this kind or trade. They will be scams. 4. COVID vaccine scams. A resident has reported a call purporting to be from a health service agency asking lots of questions about COVID vaccines, health passports and other personal details. When the phone number was checked on who called me, the feedback overwhelmingly indicates that the callers are scammers. Do not engage with these callers. 5. O2 scam calls. Reports of scam calls purporting to be O2, stating that your SIM would be blocked if you didn't give them your details, and they would deliver a new SIM in a couple of days. Do not engage with these callers. This will be it a phishing exercise to obtain personal information. Six, Amazon calls. Don't engage with calls purporting to be Amazon. There'll be scammers who will try to take over your computer and have been known to take thousands of pounds from their victims. Amazon will never contact you about a purchase. If you're at all concerned, log into your Amazon account and check the activity that way. 7. Online adverts. Please be careful when responding to online adverts, either through pop-ups or via social media that are endorsed by celebrities. Scammers are using artificial intelligence to create deep fakes of various celebrities endorsing different schemes or products. These will be scams. Awards are plenty at the 2024 Vectis Radio Community Awards Ceremony from the Island Echo, read by Joyce. The 2024 Vectis Radio Isle of Wight Community Awards Ceremony was held at the Riverside Centre on Friday the 15th of March, recognising the work of selfless islanders Over a 100 people were in the Trafalgar Room to witness the awards being presented by the High Sheriff, Dawn Haig Thomas. Interval entertainment was provided by Huxley Magic 
adding to the overall fun of the evening. Maggie Curry, who organised the event, said, The atmosphere was amazing, everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves, and the support from all the organisations for each other was humbling to see. I am so pleased with the success of the event and how it raises awareness of these organisations, a number of which I'd never heard of. I'd like to thank the panel of independent judges who had the real task on their hands making their choices. Ian Mack, Vectis Radio, station manager and co-compare for the evening, said it was humbling to be in the same room as all these people who work tirelessly for our island community. Let's continue to celebrate and support them all year round. I can't wait until we do it all again in 2025. I must thank our headline sponsors for this year, the Waterfront Bar and Restaurant in Totland. Without their financial support, we wouldn't have been able to put on such a great evening. 2024 Awards Winners, Community Project of the Year, Gold, Whitehorse CIC, Silver, IOW, Prostate Cancer Support Group, Bronze, Free Food in the Bay, Highly Commended, Older Persons Good Living Show, New Community Project of the Year, Gold, Men Only, IOW, Silver, Pan Together, Bronze, IOW, Round Table, Highly Commended, Creations Dance Academy, Highly Commended, Sandown Carnival, People Focused Community Project of the Year, Gold, IOW Prostate Cancer Support Group, Silver, Veterans Hub, Bronze, Music Craft CIC, Highly Commended, Free Food in the Bay, Animal Focus Community Project of the Year, Gold, IOW Donkey Sanctuary, Silver, Friends of the Animals, Bronze, Cats Protection IOW, Highly Commended, RSPCA. Island-based International Project of the Year, Gold, Kafuta Tumbang School Trust, Silver, Mad Aid. Fundraiser of the Year, Gold, Catherine Grimes White Brainy Bunch, Silver, Clive Ford, IOW Summer Camp, Bronze, Terry and Sue Ramplin, Long Lane Lights, Highly Commended, Sarah Tyrrell Jones, Breast Cancer Now. Volunteer of the Year, Gold, Day, Dave, sorry, Dale Hillier, Veterans Hub, Silver, Terence Cribs, HUK, IOW, Bronze, Sue Godridge, RSPCA, Highly Commended, Graham Cherry, IOW, Food Bank, Highly Commended, Simon Ledger, Tracker Dog. Inspirational Person of the Year, voted for by the public, Winner, Kirsty Chapman, The Better Days Cafe, Runner-Up, Dale Hillier, Veterans Hub, Runner-Up, Kelly Marison, Burlesque Chair Dance, Community Champion, Vectis Radio's Personal Choice, Steph Burgess, Caf Isola, Overall Community Hero, Dale Hillier, Veterans Hub. This is Michael reading an article from Ireland Echo. Red Funnel refuses to answer questions over Red Jet 4 and future of high-speed service. Red Funnel has refused to answer questions about its plans to avoid further disruption moving forward after an apparent decision to remove Red Jet 4 from its operational high-speed fleet. The Australian-built Redjet 4 was pulled from service back in November last year when an engine failed, prompting a fire service response. Customers have been led to believe that repairs are being undertaken and that the vessel will return in due course. But it has been confirmed this week that Redjet 4 has only partially had her certification renewed with the high-speed craft appearing for sale online 
at a price of $3.4 million, around £2.6 million. Island Echo has asked the cross-solent operator to confirm when exactly the decision was taken not to bring Red Jet 4 back into service and whether or not the vessel will ever return to the West Cowes Southampton route. Further questions have been asked about what the company is doing to ensure a revised timetable isn't almost constantly in operation. Should one of the two remaining red jets break down, as has been the case in recent months? Red Funnel has refused to answer the questions, including whether or not Red Jet 4 will be replaced by a new high-speed craft, perhaps to be called Red Jet 8. Even if a replacement craft was ordered today, it would take at least 12 months before Red Jet 8 was on the water, indicating that many disruptive months lay ahead for commuters, day trippers and holiday makers. Some comment has been provided on the situation though. Liana Lake's operating director at Red Funnel has said, although Red Jet 4 is an older vessel, we have had interest from the other operators in her and we are carefully considering our options regarding her future, in alignment with prioritising the reliability and sustainability of our services. We have only partially renewed her certification and are focused on ensuring that Red Jets 6 and 7 operates a reliable and punctual service to the high standards that our customers rightly expect. We will update further in due course regarding Red Jet 4. This is Petrina reading from the Island Echo. Braiding sewer repairs still not completed more than a month after failure. A busy road connecting the outskirts of Ride to Braiding remains closed this week as Southern Water continues efforts to repair a failed sewage pipe. West Lane which runs between Ashy and Braiding, has been closed for more than a month after it was discovered that a major sewage main had failed in a field just off the carriageway. Since 16th February, Southern Water engineers have been working to resolve the situation. However, continuing poor weather has hampered efforts to fix the pipe. It was hoped that the mains would be replaced by 1st March with delays pushing the timetable back to last Thursday. But those plans failed to materialise. Southern Water now says that the repair will take place this coming Thursday, nearly five weeks after the pipe failed. It's thought that the main pumping station at Apley in Ryde will be shut off to stop the flow of sewage to Sandown, with the whole of Ride and Seaview's waste going into large holding tanks instead. Once the pipe is fixed, the tanks will be turned back on, allowing the waste to continue its journey to the treatment plant in Sandown. This article from the Island Echo, read by Howard, is concerned with levels of childhood obesity on the island. The Isle of Wight's Public Health Director has announced a crackdown on children's obesity and dubbed it one of the most significant public health challenges we have as a society. New figures have revealed that nearly one in four children in reception were overweight or obese on the Isle of Wight in 2022-23, but the figure rose to one in three for year six pupils. In his annual report, Let's Not Wait, enabling the Isle of Wight's children to be a healthy weight, Simon Bryant has shifted his focus to halt the worsening trend of rising levels of childhood overweight and obesity. He's calling for health services to make fighting childhood obesity a key priority as the percentage of overweight or obese children is now being accepted as normal. His report was not highlighting concerns about how people look, Mr. Bryan said, but the impact it has on health. The rising trend can be reversed, he said, to reduce the risk for future generations. 
If the island fails to act now, Mr. Bryan said, the predicted levels of childhood obesity are predicted to increase by 35% in reception years and then 32.4% of year six pupils by 2039, although it's likely to be even higher, the councillor said. The authority has highlighted studies which show obese children and young people are five times more likely to be obese in child adulthood than those who are not obese as children. Speaking at the council's cabinet meeting last week, Mr. Bryant said he wanted to highlight the issue so they could act together with colleagues across the island as the authority couldn't do it alone. He said how we live, the way we live and the behaviour we undertake means it's a lot harder for us to be a healthier weight. The council will be writing to key leaders and with them develop an action plan to tackle the problem. The authority will also create an Isle of Wight healthy weight approach which will include lessons on healthy living, providing nutritious and varied free school meals for some children, and environments that promote physical activity. New funding to accelerate charge point rollout across the island from Isle of Wight Radio, read by Joyce. More than £1.6 million will be invested into providing new electric vehicle charge points across the island, The Isle of Wight Council secured funding through the government's Local Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Scheme, LEVI, to support the installation of hundreds of new EV chargers. Those funds will be used to expand the current network of 33 publicly accessible EV charge points on the island to more than 500 charge sockets by 2030. In particular, The council wants to plan for residents that do not have off-street parking and who will be completely reliant on the public network. Councillor Phil Jordan, council leader and cabinet member for highways and infrastructure said, It's excellent to hear that we have been successful in our funding bid to further support the installation of hundreds of new charge points across the island. There has been an increasing demand for public charging facilities and, with our private sector partners, we've been able to install 33 green electricity charge points across the island. I look forward to facilitating more charging options for islanders and visitors alike over the next couple of years. More and more drivers are making the switch to electric vehicles, with fully electric vehicles accounting for over 16% of the new UK car market in 2023, according to industry statistics. The funding will support the delivery of hundreds of low-powered charge points on the street, helping more drivers get from A to B easily and supporting island families make the switch. This is Michael reading an article from Island Echo. Wild Heart Sanctuary branches out with grant funding. The Wild Heart Animal Sanctuary has planted 27 native trees within the sanctuary's grounds, thanks to funding from the Tree Council's Branching Out Fund and help from their volunteers and gardening club members. Branching Out provides grants ranging from £250 to £2,500 to community groups, schools, small registered charities seeking to establish trees, hedgerows and orchards throughout the winter planting season to support biodiversity and further develop green spaces. A variety of native trees, including black elder, English oak and field maple trees were planted across the whole site on the 16th and 17th of February. Trees were chosen that have edible leaves and branches for the sanctuary's omnivores so that the animal team can use fallen boughs to create enrichment activities and diversify their animals' diets. And in the farm area, they were planted to provide shade for the rescued pigs in the summer. The new trees will also improve the overall aesthetic 
of this sanctuary and encourage local wildlife to visit and thrive. One of the young gardening club members even noted, when this tree is big and strong, I will come and see what birds are living in it. Christine Harty, the sanctuary's head of fundraising, said, We are grateful to the Tree Council for providing this generous grant, which allows our sanctuary to increase our biodiversity, support native tree growth, develop our green spaces and engage with our local community. The Tree Council Grants Officer Geraldine Creaven has said, Branching out presents a fantastic opportunity for schools and community groups, large and small, to get their spades in the ground and start establishing life-enhancing and biodiversity-boosting trees, hedgerows and orchards in their neighbourhoods. We are so thrilled for all our successful applicants, especially the Wild Heart Animal Sanctuary. This is Petrina reading from Isle of Wight Radio. Island Road Charity Boost helps the way forward. An island charity has taken delivery of a minibus purchased with the help of a £14,000 grant from Island Road's Isle of Wight Foundation. The Way Forward programme provides support, training and employment for people aged from 12 upwards with physical and learning difficulties, autism and people recovering from mental ill health. The money donated by the Isle of Wight Foundation alongside the Way Forward programme self-funded, shares of £10,000, enabled the charity to replace one of their ageing minibuses coming to the end of its serviceable life. As well as taking customers to and from its centre on Daishway, Newport, the smart 12-seater bus will be used for daily sessions and respite holidays to enrich the users' lives. The Isle of Wight Foundation, which was established by the companies behind Island Roads, Ringway Islands Road, Meridian, Island Roads, Services and Vinci Concessions, gives grants to island good courses each year and has now distributed more than £750,000 in the 10 years it has been running. Tracy Hill, the Way Forward Chief Executive, said comfortable and reliable transport for its customers was important. For example, we are going on a four-night holiday to Centre Parks in Longleat at will ensure they have a good journey to and from the park. She said, I'd like to thank Island Roads and the Isle of Wight Foundation for its generosity. Over the years, they have given us several grants that have made a huge difference. Moreover, they have also really taken an interest in what we do and we have formed a very strong partnership. Part of OCEL Enterprises The Way Forward programme organises a range of activities from its customers from art and crafts to cookery and drama. Rob Gillespie, Isle of Wight Foundation chairman, said It is marvellous to help such enthusiastic local charities make such a difference to the lives of people on the island. Working with the way forward and providing well-deserved funding towards this wonderful charity's minibus is particularly rewarding, as we know how important reliable transport is. This article from the Isle of Wight Radio, read by Howard, concerns concessionary travel on the Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight Council is to hand local bus operator Southern Vectis more money than last year to offset those eligible for concessionary travel. Southern Vectis says it's transporting about the same number of paying passengers as it did in 2019, that's pre-COVID, while the number of people travelling with concessions is about 92% of pre-pandemic levels, although numbers have risen compared to last year. Up from around 4.6 million in 2023, the Council will pay 4.976 million to reimburse fees for islanders who travel free 
under concessionary fares. The Department for Transport says operators should be no better or worse off as a result of the concessionary travel scheme, including for older people and those with disabilities. The Isle of Wight Council will pay 30p more per concessionary journey compared with 2019. The authority is facing an overspend of £39,000 compared to what had been allocated in the budget, but says the money will be found in the budgets for its highways and transportation departments. In previous years, council cash helped support southern vectors when passenger numbers slumped. Now, figures shared by Southern Vectis with the Isle of Wight Council reveal the island is outperforming many other locations in terms of passenger numbers. Meanwhile, community bus routes, including the West White FYT bus, will receive a share of £30,000. The payments were agreed at a meeting of the Isle of Wight Council's Cabinet on Thursday, March 14th. The figures are indicative of the island moving and getting back to work, said Councillor Ian Stevenson, the authority's deputy leader. Councillor Paul Fuller, a frequent user of public transport, said bus services are key to ensuring residents feel included. Introduction of new free school on the island halted as no one yet found to run it. From the Island Echo, read by Joyce. The launch of a new special free school on the Isle of Wight has been delayed indefinitely as there is a struggle to find someone to run it. More than a year ago, parents, carers and pupils with special educational needs and or disabilities, SEND, were given the good news the Isle of Wight would be getting a new specialist school. It was planned to open next to Currisbrook College in time for September 2025 and would gradually provide places for 75 children aged 9 to 16 with autism or social, emotional and mental health conditions. There has been an at least year delay, however, the Isle of Wight Council has confirmed that no one has come forward to run it. Speaking at a meeting earlier this month, Naomi Carter, the Council's new Education Access and Inclusion Director, said, Any new school now has to be an academy, but the problem was no sponsor was willing to come to the island. An Isle of Wight Council spokesman has said, although the initial timeline has been affected, it was actively exploring alternative solutions to ensure the successful establishment of the new SEND free school. They said, our commitment to addressing the emotional needs of SEND students remains unwavering and we remain dedicated to delivering a high quality educational facility that caters to those. While we cannot provide an exact opening date, we assure the community that we are expediting the process. The Council said it is in regular discussions with the Department for Education, which is the authority responsible for making the decisions regarding Academy sponsors and most of the free school process. Updates will be shared with parents, educators and the public as the Council makes progress, it confirmed. As the search to find an Academy sponsor continues, the Authority is looking to expand the current SEND provision on the island by increasing places in special schools. The two specialist schools on the island are currently full, the Council said, and the number of pupils needing education, health and care plans has more than doubled in the last nine years. The specialist school would significantly increase the availability of much-needed places, which currently results in the need to send young people off the island, the council said. This is the second part of the talking news read by myself, John. And Mary. We begin with more news items taken from the county press. 
MP calls for, quote, robust, unquote, action on ferry failings by John Moreno. Isle of Wight MP Bob Seeley has fired a broadside at Whitelink and Red Funnel, saying they have penalised islanders who travel and limited investment into their ferries as part of a new study. The Conservative MP for the island since 2017 was critical of both ferry firms in his detailed new probe into cross-solent ferry services. However, Mr Seeley hopes a new plan he has hatched will offer a common agenda that could solve many of the issues that have made Red Funnel and White Link a target for better criticism from customers. The Isle of Wight needs and deserves a better deal from the ferry firms than the one we have, said Mr Seeley. The status quo has lasted 40 years. I believe we need a new joint approach. Recently, islanders have been let down with delays and cancellations to both Red Funnel and White Link services. My research has led me to believe that Using a web of offshore companies, White Link and Red Funnel's owners and lenders have taken large profits out of the firms for years. To drive efficiency and take even more profits, directors have cut timetables, introduced surge pricing, which penalises islanders for making essential journeys at peak times, and limited investment in ferries, some of which are now 34 years old. Islanders are tired of technical and mechanical issues. The firms pay little to no corporation tax and are accountable only to their shareholders. We all lose. So far, I have raised the issues with three secretaries of state for transport and three separate maritime ministers. We have had some victories, including White Link's discounted fares scheme for islanders, better rail connections at Lymington, and later services into Ride Pierhead. However, we need a collective plan to turn things around. The report includes ideas for better services, pricing and ticketing, with more transparent ownership, and identifies the problems and potential solutions. We need more robust arrangements in place to hold ferry services to account, and that includes regulation. The MP's report considers proposals for a Solent Ferries Regulator, Department for Transport Oversight, price caps on health journeys and voluntary regulation. Mr Seeley adds, a regulator could mandate more regular services permanent improvements in early and late passenger services, stronger sanctions for the operators when services are cancelled, better compensation schemes for passengers affected by cancelled sailings, and duties placed on ferry companies to better connect with rail services. The regulator could also mandate greater discounts for islanders, more multi-link ticketing options and electronic through ticketing on all services with ongoing rail connections and options for foot passengers to book seats. Mr Seeley said there were sound reasons why now is the time to act. Services, timetables and prices are currently at the ferry firm's discretion, continued the MP. However, with the government already looking at minimum service levels for passenger rail, I think we should ask them to look at similar options for ferries. Mr Seeley is seeking feedback on his study in the coming weeks through his website www.bobseeley.org.uk slash ferry services with a view to producing a final report which he hopes will be backed by the Isle of Wight Council to begin re-engaging with government ministers, officials and the ferry firms with a clear agenda and priorities. Red Funnel Vessel for Sale Amid Disruption Red Funnel's Red Jet 4 is up for sale 
amid ongoing concerns over the reliability of the ferry firm. It told the county press it has only partially renewed the boat's certification and is prioritising the route's remaining vessels. Last week, we revealed eight directors resigned their positions on February the 28th. Red Funnel described it as a review of its board structures and memberships and said it was in support of its fleet replacement programme. It would not comment on speculation that it could be about to change hands. Over the weekend, hundreds of passengers were left stranded as major disruption hit its Southampton to the island routes. Red Jet 6 and 7 and its vehicle ferry service were almost entirely out of service. Only one vehicle ferry was in operation for a time. On Monday, longer replacement solent crossings were being run by Blue Funnel. Red Funnel has blamed technical reasons and some boats have now returned to service. The weekend's problems included a water jet issue with Red Jet 6, a starboard jet room problem on Red Jet 7, and further issues with the vehicle ferries. Radar showed the boats alongside in Southampton, and one passenger said they had seen a ferry being towed. Another islander who was caught up in the problems was keen to praise staff, said writing. Everyone was so helpful and did absolutely everything to help the situation. I would like to say well done to all the staff on that crossing. They handled a very difficult situation admirably. It is not their fault when technical problems occur. Isle of Wight MP Bob Seeley took to social media to vent his frustration with the problems. It's simply not good enough, Fran Collins. Either run a bloody service or get someone else to do so, he said on X, taking aim at the operator's CEO. Meanwhile, Red Funnel says Red Jet 4, one of its oldest boats, has had interest from other operators. Leanna Lake's operations director said, we are focused on ensuring that Red Jet 6 and 7 operates a reliable and punctual service to the high standards that our customers rightly expect. A listing on website shipselector.com shows a catamaran with redacted branding for sale through broker Lake Maritime Corps. It is on the market for $3.15 million. The County Press previously asked Red Funnel to provide a statement on rumours that it could be changing hands. In response, it said it would not comment on speculation. Remaining as directors are CEO Frank Collins, who was appointed in June 2018, with Ian James Delaney, non-executive director, Stephen Blackney Ridgeway and Eric Jorgen Osterogard. Ferry CEO apologises for chaos. The CEO of Red Funnel apologised for travel chaos that left scores of passengers stranded in Southampton last weekend. In a statement, Fran Collins expressed regret over the disruption between the island and Southampton. She went on to acknowledge the inconvenience caused to passengers caught up in the problems that saw all but one of the company's fleet unable to operate and extended apologies on behalf of the entire Red Funnel team. Miss Collins said, We wish to apologise on behalf of everyone at Red Funnel for the disruption experienced by many of our customers travelling between Southampton and the Isle of Wight. We know this level of service is not acceptable to the island, and nor is it aligned with our own standards. Red Funnel staff work tirelessly to rectify the issues and support passengers, she said. Looking forward, Miss Collins said she was grateful to customers for their patience during what she called a challenging period. She pledged the ferry firm's commitment to returning to a normal timetable as safely and as quickly as possible, 
Miss Collins remains one of four Red Funnel directors, following a host of resignations on February 28th. Rink campaigners vow to step up fight. Nearly a decade on from the closure of Ride Arena, members of the Isle of Wight's ice skating community insist their passion and spark is more alive than ever and they will not give up the fight. Days after it was announced Isle of Wight Distillery had pulled out of plans to turn the building into an attraction, Ride to Mayor, councillors, skaters and ex-employees gathered outside the eyesore to renew their calls for action. Councillor Michael Lilly of Ride Community Development Trust and who will represent the Liberal Democrats in Isle of Wight East at the next general election, told the county press the building has been allowed to fall into a state of disrepair. There's a hole in the roof and it's a swimming pool inside from the rain, he said. Unless some serious work is done on it, it will erode further and it will become impossible for anyone to take it over. He claims the lack of maintenance is why the distillery pulled out and there are currently no other interested buyers. The freehold is owned by the council, but since 2014, the lease has been in the hands of AEW. The investment firm said it will continue to maintain the condition of the property in accordance with its leasehold obligations while it works on future plans for the building. But Ride Mayor Richard May said there was no evidence to suggest AEW have any serious intent to maintain the building and he called on the Isle of Wight Council to step forward. When you come in to ride, the first thing you see is a derelict building, he said. Jim Matthews, who started working there in 1991, says he was the last one out when it was shut in 2016 called the building's current state a crying shame, while Matt Russell, a former figure skating coach, said part of him feels a little bit lost. Ice dancers Steve and Carol Taverner, who competed in the national and international competitions, called it a tragic waste of what should be an excellent resource. For Rye Community Development Trust, Robbie Jones said there's more of a drive now more than ever to continue the fight. He said the trust intends to pull the community and stakeholders together. Councillor Lilly said a public meeting to look at the next steps is in the process of being organised. Floating bridge to be replaced. The troubled three and a half million floating bridge, six, will be replaced, the Isle of Wight Council has announced. The Council's Executive Cabinet body unanimously agreed to replace the current chain ferry, which has been plagued with issues since it was installed in 2017, in a decision which has been a long time coming, said Councillor Phil Jordan, the authority's leader. Speaking at the Cabinet meeting last Thursday evening, Councillor Jordan said he knew it was a decision people had been waiting for, and so had he. It is the start of a process we will have to go through, but we have found a stage process which will enable us to bring the vessel forward more efficiently and quickly, with a number of options coming forward, he said. This island needs to know we are replacing the floating bridge. The executive body agreed previous information, gathered by the council in multiple reports and reviews over the years, should be used to inform the next stages of replacing the vessel. The council would be working with consultants 3S, which recently carried out computer modelling and an analysis of Floating Bridge 6 and determined the vessel would always need a push boat to help it cross the river at strong tides. The consultants also said any replacement vessel would have to be radically redesigned with a new hull or superstructure. Councillor Jordan said some of the options may not be a financial burden to the council and the decision did not commit 
the authority to additional investment in a new vessel at this time. Councillor Carl Love, the ward representative for East Cowes, clapped when Councillor Jordan read out the recommendations and said he felt, since he had come into office, he had dealt with nothing but the floating bridge. He said the Cabinet's decision removes the heartache his community has suffered in the last seven years. Councillor Love said, Remember, this is not going to be a quick fix. This will be a few more years yet, but the end is in sight. I am sure it will come as a great relief to taxpayers. We cannot continue to shed millions and millions of pounds on this when it should have been dealt with earlier. World War II bombing victim finally recognised. On the morning of April the 7th, 1943, eight Luftwaffe planes dropped bombs on Newport, causing devastation. There has always been debates about whether it was 20 or 21 lives lost, as one man was seriously injured, dying five months later, meaning he was often not included in memorials. However, as of January this year, nearly 81 years later, Alfred Rackett has now officially been recognised as a victim of the bombing. When a bomb exploded at Timber Merchant Maury's, now Dewson's, in Trafalgar Road, Alfred Rackett suffered a broken back in the blast. He died at his home, 29 New Street, on September 25th, 1943, with his wife Elizabeth by his side. Situated at Mountjoy Cemetery, there was a restoration of his grave, paid for by a personal donation. Discussions began with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, CWGC, to see if Alfred could be recognised as an official victim of the bombing. In January 2023, the CWGC confirmed they had investigated Alfred's case and he would now be officially included in the war dead. A brick with Alfred's name, engraved by Island Memorials, will now be added to the Newport and Carisbrook Community Council Memorial in Church Lytton, alongside the names of the 20 other lives that were lost. Newport and Carisbrook Deputy Clerk Lucinda Bradley said, I am delighted that Alfred Rackett has finally been recognised as a victim of the bombing. My thanks go to Gary Newman of the CWGC for his help and Island Memorials for once again showing generosity and ensuring the victims of that tragic day are still remembered all these years later. Armed Forces Day will be a stonker by John Marino. Armed Forces Day, AFD, will be jaw-dropping when it returns to Ride's Eastern Gardens on Sunday, June 30th, Isle of Wight organisers have predicted. Last year it attracted more than 3,500 visitors. Forces veteran Councillor Ian Dorr, the local authority's Armed Forces Champion and AFD Committee Chair, said this year's event is shaping up to be just as good. Prep started last summer and we will be announcing the attendees over the next few months. Rest assured it's going to be a stonker, he said. There are thrilling air assets to inspire and excite, plus more on the ground to get interactive with. This includes engagement teams, live demos and, of course, live acts on stage. Throw into the mix a marching parade, the associated bands, military vehicles, kids' activities, cadets and reservists, and you have another top-quality AFD event coming your way. The Isle of Wight AFD is a chance to show your support for the men and women who make up the armed forces community. From currently serving troops to service families, veterans, reservists, cadets, and supporting registered charities, showing support for the British Armed Forces provides a much-valued morale boost for the troops and their families. Ride Esplanade provides the perfect opportunity to display land, sea and air assets. 
Councillor Dorr added, We, of course, will be commemorating the 80th anniversary of D-Day with the inclusion into the programme of two very special guests and an incredible musical performance from that era. Many from the island made huge sacrifices and we must never forget the vital roles played by them and their families. We are forever in their debt for what they gave for the future generations, not only of our country, but our island. Isle of Wight AFD is going to be one of the must attend events of the summer. Journalist wanted. Are you a passionate, self-starting journalist interested in local decision making and its impact on islanders? The perfect job has come up. You will be reporting from the heart of local politics at the Isle of Wight County Council's County Hall in Newport and across the island, holding the local authority and decision making makers to account. Based at the Isle of Wight County Press, as part of the BBC funded Local Democracy Reporting LDR service, your stories will be shared across a host of island and south coast media online in print and on air. Your work could also feature in the national press. Outgoing LDR Louise Hill has held the position since September 2019. She said, in the four and a bit years I have been the LDR for the island, I have loved it. From covering a change in council administration and school closures to uncollected waste bins and trees being planted, no day is the same. The role of LDR is a vitally important one as it means you are in the council chamber hearing all the crucial decisions being made which affect our day-to-day -day lives. I would recommend the job to anyone interested in holding public authorities to account, those who like to dig behind a story and find the truth, and those who don't mind reading a lot of reports and attending meetings. We are looking for someone with enthusiasm, confidence and an eye for detail, as well as the ability to write engaging copy, seek out exclusives and generate off-diary news. An understanding of the importance of video, audio and images and how they enhance the story would be ideal. As the LDR, you will dig out the stories that really matter and develop contacts along the way. Knowledge of the Isle of Wight and a passion for the way local government works are crucial. The LDR service is a national scheme designed to increase coverage and scrutiny of councils across the UK. Applications will be considered as soon as they are received and the vacancy will close no later than April the 12th. To apply, visit Careers New Quest dot co dot uk slash job slash local democracy reporter fixed term contract 1875 aspx beach closed amid fears of cliff collapse by oliver dyer a large landslip has led to the closure of an island beach as walkers report cracks and holes as deep as 40 feet appearing in the clifftop above. The Isle of Wight Council is reminding islanders to be extra vigilant with further coastal erosion likely. In videos sent to the county press by islander Glenn Martin, large cracks can be seen on the popular coastal path at Atherfield Point off Military Road. Glenn, a keen fossil hunter who walks his dog along the route three times a week, said a section of the cliff, which he estimates to be around 50 metres long and 7 metres wide, is on the verge of collapse. He said, sections tend to peel off, then break up over winter. However, this winter the erosion has been exceptional. It's right on the path, so caution is needed in this area now. Access to the beach at Atherfield Point has been shut for a few months, the council said. But last week, the authority said it had to reposition the closed signs and barriers after a large landslip. 
Reacting to news of cracks appearing in the clifftop, a spokesperson said, we will inspect again to see if it has worsened and will of course reposition closed signs and barriers if required for public safety. Although weather appears to be on the improvement, the council said landslips and coastal erosion is very likely to continue for the foreseeable future. It is reminding people to be extra vigilant when on the coast, whether it be walking along cliff paths or on the beach beneath. The recent landslip comes at a time when the future of the island's iconic military road, which runs next to Atherfield Point, is in question. There are warnings it could fall into the sea within years, but there have been calls to safeguard the route. Elsewhere on the island, there have been large falls in St Lawrence and in Bonchurch in December, which led to the closure of Leeson Road and left a cafe teetering on the edge. Night to remember for island sports stars. A selection of the island's many unsung sporting heroes and those who support them were honoured at the 49th annual Isle of Wight Sports Achievement Awards last night, Thursday. A ceremony to celebrate the island's sports stars was held at Newport's Medina Theatre at 7pm. The ceremony celebrated the island's sporting success stories, recognising outstanding achievement or service from sportsmen and women during the 2023 calendar year. Awards went not only to sports achievers, but for sportsmanship and to coaches, volunteers and schools which have done most to promote local sport and help their club to develop. The, the awards also included nominations for the best sporting primary and secondary schools on the island, in promoting and inspiring physical activity this year. All were judged by an independent panel. Hosting the evening were journalists Romilly Weeks and the County Press's Lucy Morgan. Those shortlisted have been featured in the County Press during the last past few weeks. Shipwreck Centre to move into empty school site. A maritime attraction is to move into a former primary school after a bid was accepted by the Isle of Wight Council. Yarmouth Primary School has been empty since its pupils moved to Freshwater and it was marked as surplus to educational requirements. Ariton's Shipwreck Centre will now move there after a successful bid by Yarmouth Community Foundation which is made up of Herapath Shenton Trust and the Maritime Archaeology Trust. A Centre for Education and Activities will be created along with eight affordable houses. A total of 12 bids were received for the Mill Road site and the preferred option received 55 emails of support. An agreement must be reached with the government before the sale can be finalised. Yarmouth Community Foundation wants to buy the site from County Hall for 435,000, of which the council would keep 400,000 and the Department for Education would be given the rest. Other proposals range from 50,000 to 677,000 and could have seen the site turned into a boatyard, retirement apartments, a powerboat school and hospitality centre, or a food outlet. Yarmouth Town Council's plan for affordable housing and a cultural, creative and exhibition centre finished as third favourite bid. Titmarch's Island Delight Alan Titmarsh, the narrator of the hit TV series Isle of Wight, Jewel of the South, has told the county press he is absolutely delighted with the positive impact the show has had. It comes after holiday lettings agency holidaycottages.co.uk revealed a boom in tourist securing trips to the island for 2024. Although it said the spike in February wasn't solely down to the Channel 5 show, it certainly played a big part. 
With Easter fast approaching, the boss of Visit Ida of White is hoping to see more of the same. Alan Titmarsh, who voiced the series and has had a home here for more than 20 years, said, I love the island and I was keen to make more people aware of its delights. When it comes to variety of terrain, from downland to woodland and coast, and the number of initiatives, from food production to sailing and exploring history, I reckon the island is matchless. I'm absolutely delighted that the series has gone down so well and hope that the success is matched by increased visitor numbers. I'm sure we can make everyone welcome. Ahead of the Easter holidays, Visit Isle of Wight said the Visit Britain sentiment tracker, which gauges whether people are likely to take short breaks, shows a year-on-year -year increase in people wanting to take a domestic trip. Will Miles, Managing Director of Visit Isle of Wight, said, It would be great to take advantage of that, with people wanting to experience outdoor areas, take part in leisure and sports activities, and visit attractions. The island has got a lot going on this Easter, with traditional activities such as Easter egg hunts alongside adventure trails, walking, cycling, history, live music and much more. Hannah Cooper, Regional Head of Sales at HolidayCottages.co.uk said, We've seen an even split of 40% of bookings taking place in spring and 40% taking place in summer. March and June are proving particularly popular with 15 and 16% of the share. Ofsted praises nursery by Louise Hill. A nursery has fallen from outstanding to good, but has been praised by Ofsted inspectors. Top Day Nurseries, based at the Isle of Wight College in Newport, was visited by the government's education watchdog in February, after a near six-year break. In a recently released report, Inspectors said children excitedly come into the nursery and have warm and secure bonds with the kind and caring staff. Inspectors said staff promote the development of children's imagination and their critical thinking and literacy skills. Children, including those with special educational needs, make good progress and the provision is adapted to meet their needs and children flourish, the report says. The curriculum focuses on children being resilient, confident, independent and creative, inspectors said, and builds on what they already know and can do as they progress through the nursery. Inspectors did say managers need to develop further supervision and coaching to enhance the staff's understanding of the curriculum. Overall, managers prioritise staff's well-being and ensure they are offered the support they need. Another area for improvement inspectors highlighted was to review hygiene routines to ensure children are consistently taught good hygiene practices. They said children begin to learn good practices, but these are not followed through, as inspectors saw young children drinking from each other's cups, risking cross-infection. Inspectors said parents speak highly of the provision and the warm and welcoming staff, and say their children have a strong sense of belonging at the nursery. Manager of Tops Newport, Lauren Paris said she was extremely proud of the whole team who have worked hard to get the result. She said they were extremely grateful for the praise parents gave the team and appreciated the kind comments made. This goes to show our staff engage with the parents' wishes and go above and beyond for both the parent and child, she said. We could not be more grateful. The team always provide exciting experiences for all the children and that's exactly what the inspector saw. 200 years serving the island. Not only is Red Funnel the original Isle of Wight ferry service, but it's reached reach back more than 200 years. 
It provides vital transportation links between the Isle of Wight and the mainland, and the distinctive red funnels have become an iconic symbol of the crossing. There was serious disruption recently when the company experienced technical issues with both Red Jet 7 and 6, the high-speed passenger services. However, this was a short-term blemish on the long and mostly unwavering service of the last two decades. It all began when the Isle of Wight Royal Main Mail Steam Packet Company was launched in 1820, offering the first steamer service between Cowes and Southampton. Six years later, and Southampton established its own ferry service, the Isle of Wight Steam Packet Company. The two companies began collaborating and introduced a joint timetable in 1928. They ran together harmoniously without opposition for more than 30 years. The emergence of a competitor in 1960, the Southampton, Isle of Wight and Portsmouth Improved Steamboat Company, prompted the two existing operators to merge in 1961. The merger formed the Southampton Isle of Wight and South of England Royal Mail Steam Packet Company Limited, a formal name that held the record for the longest registered company name in the UK. The trading name Red Funnel Steamers was adopted in 1935 inspired by the red funnels with black tops sported by all their ships at the time. The name was later shortened to Red Funnel, the current name. The service quickly gained popularity for its efficiency and convenience, revolutionising travel and trade between the Isle of Wight and mainland England. Over time, the company expanded its routes and modernised its fleet to meet the increasing demand for steamship services. The 20th century saw the introduction of purpose-built car ferries, with the first one being the motor vessel Carisbrook Castle in 1959. To encounter competition from hovercrafts, Red Funnel introduced high-speed services using hydrofoils in 1969. Hydrofoils are watercraft that use underwater wings to lift the hull above the water at higher speeds, reducing drag and increasing efficiency. This innovative technology allowed Red Funnel to offer faster and more efficient transportation options for passengers travelling between destinations. The introduction of hydrofoils by Red Funnel marked a significant advancement in maritime transportation showcasing the company's commitment to staying ahead in the competitive industry. They ran until 1990, but the route is now served by high-speed, passenger-only catamarans. The passenger service goes from Cowes to Southampton, while a vehicle ferry service serves from East Cowes. Red Funnel services have constantly evolved to meet the demands of travellers, including freight and passenger transportation. Solar Shipwrecks Explored by Richard Jones The body of water stretching between the Isle of Wight and mainland Britain looks on a normal day to be a sheltered and tranquil stretch of calm sea, sometimes getting a bit rough during the winter months as the warship, warships sail out of Portsmouth and the huge cruise liners depart from Southampton, a perfect place to ship spot. But you may be surprised to know that the Solent holds more secrets and history than first realised. We can go back many hundreds of years to a time when sailing vessels ruled the world, taking, for example, the story of the most famous Solent wreck, that of the warship Mary Rose. King Henry VIII was watching the scene from South Sea Castle when the ship sailed from Portsmouth Harbour, heading towards the waiting French fleet and preparing for battle. But, with one dramatic turn, the entire ship heeled over and sank in front of the king, trapping many people below decks who were caught up in netting that was rigged to repel potential enemy boarding parties. 
Nobody knows just how many people died, could be anything between 400 and 700, but what we do know is that only around 35 survived because they were taking up their position within the rigging above all the nets. The wreck was lost over time and forgotten about until the Dean brothers located her while conducting work on unsnagging fishing gear. When they realised this was the Mary Rose, they proceeded to salvage a number of cannon before once again the ship was left to rest alone. Alexander McKean found her in the 1970s and started a huge salvage operation, raising the entire hull from the seabed in 1982 and having the wreck and her artefacts placed in a museum where she is on display today. Other warships fell victim to fire, explosion, grounding and pure negligence. The likes of HMS Boyne, HMS Invincible, HMS Royal George and, as we go more into the modern day, HMS Gladiator. The Gladiator was a cruiser launched in 1896 and was heading back to port off Hearst Point on April 25th, 1908, when the liner St Paul slammed into the ship causing massive damage. The cruiser capsized and killed 28 of her crew, some of the bodies later being laid to rest in Haslar Naval War Cemetery in Gosport. The wreck was later salvaged and broken up. AI was the sixth British submarine after the first five were named Holland. During a 1904 diving operation in the Solent, the ocean liner Berwick Castle accidentally rammed her and she sank with all 11 crew killed. Incredibly, the submarine was raised and put back into service, later sunk during a test in the same body of water and is today a protected historic wreck. The two world wars put pay to many cargo vessels but the 1972 capsizing of the hovercraft SRN 6-012 saw the world's worst hovercraft di disaster just off the seafront at South Sea that led to the deaths of five passengers and led to these craft having more stringent rules. In January 1990, the cargo ship Flag Theofano was due into Southampton with a cargo of cement when the stormy weather prevented a pilot guiding the ship in. The ship went to anchor and the following day was given a green light to head to her final destination. But when the pilot went to bring the ship in, there was nothing to be seen. Assuming the ship had headed back out to sea, the horrifying truth was soon learned as bodies started to wash ashore. Flag Theofano had sunk in the night so quickly there was no time to send a distress call. All 19 crew members were killed. Another cargo ship that came a cropper was the banana boat Dole America in November 1999. Heading out of Portsmouth in the early hours, the pilot had only just departed the vessel when, of all things, she struck Nab Tower. Needless to say, the press had a field day, with the reports the following day as Nab Tower is a lighthouse. On January the 3rd, 2015, the huge car carrier Hogasaka set sail from Southampton with a cargo of vehicles. As the ship cleared Southampton water, she got into difficulties when the ship could not stay upright and developed a significant list. The ship was purposefully grounded at Bramble Bank and her crew rescued. Our salvage teams had a huge job of trying to move the ship without causing her to be lost completely. Incredibly, the salvage operation was a success. Richard Jones's book, Shipwrecks of the Solent, is available now. My View by Carl Love, Vice Chairman of the Isle of Wight Council and Councillor for East Coast. 
I feel great shame as freedom of speech was effectively swept aside on Wednesday night when 20 councillors voted to reject a motion asking for a full public consultation about the introduction of a new committee system as the basis for running the Isle of Wight Council. Additionally, some, including Councillor Jeff Brodie, who wrote about the proposed system in last week's Isle of Wight Observer, attempted to talk the motion out of time, as it was close to the end of the meeting, and prevent any vote even taking place. You may have watched the proceedings on YouTube and seen the ridiculous behaviour of some of those trying to block the vote from taking place. The council chamber, and with it, democracy on the island, descended into chaos. Legal advice was given that the decision to continue with the vote was correct, but still the disruptive behaviour continued, although at least the vote was able to be concluded. I cannot believe that the majority of councillors voted against the rights of our community to be properly informed about the implementation of a new system of running the council, which is one of the most fundamental changes to democratic process here in the last 20 years. It beggars belief that those who earlier in the evening argued for the system as a more democratic way of running the council then denied the public any involvement in the process. The statements that appeared in last week's paper promising public consultation must now be taken with a very large pinch of salt. The action of those promoting the change had been exposed as entirely self-serving. Otherwise, why the determination to deny the public a say in things? That said, At this moment in time, it is difficult to know what meaningful consultation could take place. We still do not have the costings for the proposed change, and much of the detail about the operation and implementation of a committee system will not be available until after the currently proposed date for a decision on May 1st. Perhaps April would be a more appropriate date. The rejected proposal was to consult when all that information is available, so not only can the public be involved, but be involved in a meaningful way. We plainly saw on Wednesday that neither of these possibilities is in the interests of those pushing for this change. I'm sad that Wednesday night exposed what a number of us had previously feared, Namely, that this process is about political ambition and behind-the-scenes power games, which have no regard to the public and the delicate state of our public finances. Councillor Brodie's claim that the new system will have zero financial impact is simply wrong. The services of external consultants have already been engaged. We've not been told the cost and urgent legal advice sought when there was attempt to push the change forward in January cost the council £10,000 to be told that the attempt was illegal. The proposal is onerous. It is draining resources, including staff, away from public services at a time of ongoing austerity, when council tax is increasing and vital services are being cut back. I simply cannot see how the greater public good is being served by this. Constitutional changes like this are better considered when we can afford the time and money. Again, everything points to those pursuing this change in the way they're going about it as doing so for reasons of power and personal ambition. Wednesday night's vote sought to do away with the right for our island people to be properly informed, involved or engaged in any meaningful public debate. If that is the way in which people are pursuing the proposed change, what on earth will be the system they are seeking to bring in? What's on? The King's Head to reopen today. A popular West White pub is reopening today, Friday at noon. The King's Head Yarmouth has been closed over the winter, but is opening for the summer season with a new chef and will be serving food seven days a week. 
upcoming events at the theatre at Key Arts Centre. Uh, 5th of April, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. 10th to 13th of April, A Midsummer Night's Dream. 26th of April, The Noise Next Door. 10th of May, Dyed Blondes. 15th to 16th of May, Labels. 27th of May to 1st of June, Theatre Summer School. To find out my more go to www.keyarts.org or telephone 01983 Isle of Wight Cantata Choir 7.30 Saturday 13th of April 2024 Medina Theatre Spring Concert Zimby Lestrange Songs of Peace Todd Tickets, adults £15, under 18s £5, plus booking fee. The web, isleofwhitecantatachoir.co.uk slash concerts. Box office, 01983 Trinity Theatre Cows presents Dirty Dusting, a comedy by Ed Waugh and Trevor Wood, which contains adult humour. This is on between 18th and 20th of April at 7.30pm and 25th to 27th of April also at 7.30pm. Tickets cost £10 for adults or three for the price of two on the first night. For booking, telephone 01983 295 229. Festival spot for Italian legend. Italian chef Gennaro Contaldo will be at the Isle of Wight Food and Drink Festival, the Great White Bite when it returns to the Northwood House in Cowes on September the 7th and 8th. Gennaro, who mentored Jamie Oliver and is a regular on Saturday Morning Kitchen, said, The last time I was on the Isle of Wight was 20 years ago. I am sure a lot has changed since then but I know the island is still blessed with incredible food and drink producers. He will be demonstrating recipes from his latest cookbook, Verdure, which is all about making vegetables the star of the show. He will also be helping out the children's cookery school, The Little Chef's Den. Broadcaster Chris Bavin will return to host the chef's demonstration stage. Last year's festival was one of my highlights of the summer. There was such a great atmosphere and it was great fun with working all the local chefs, said Chris. Gernard resident, drinks expert, writer and broadcaster Helena Nicklin will also be at the event. Helena said, As a new permanent resident of the island, I have bl been blown away by what I've seen of the food and drink scene and how quickly it's growing. I couldn't be happier to bring my passion for wine and spirits to such an engaged and excited, hungry and thirsty audience. Adult co cooking classes will be run by Zoe Ombler from the Epicurean Salia. Visitors can also expect storeholders at the show, which aims to champion the food and drink industry, along with an Elton John tribute at Ultimate Elton. Chef. Matt Egan will be delivering this year's pop-up restaurant showcase, Cooking Over Fire. The Great White Bite will also be supporting the Isle of Wight Food Bank. Event director Richard Noel said, Cows is rapidly turning into one of the most exciting foodie destinations in the country. For tickets, including evening specials, visit greatwhitebite.co.uk. Now we have readers' letters. Little regard from David White of Bonchurch. Having read Mr Ferraro's letter, read the Leeson Road closure, County Press 15th of March, I fully agree with his wise comments. With the St Lawrence latest issue, this must surely be a wake-up call. We will always get suitably worded replies from the council and island roads, but mostly words are not needed but action. Actions speak louder than words. 
We have heard over and over again the old comment of we have employed consultants, etc., lots of meeting and talks, but with very little successful outcome, just spending all their time going down rabbit holes, only to find a dead end, and then coming to a lethargic halt. We could all quote many examples, but I will quote the latest. Cow's floating bridge. It is the ratepayers' money that they waste. So what happens to Ventnor and Bonchurch when the sinking road at Upper, v- Upper Ventnor collapses again, and it will very soon, just one small narrow road through Whitwell to serve the town? As for the residents and shop owners in the town, what happens to them? Shops still have to pay the rates, but don't expect much proactive help from the Isle of Wight Council, or indeed Ventnor Town Council, only the classic words, we are working hard to put things right. Ventnor Town Council has shown very little understanding of Bond Church and its problems and needs, so what hope do we mere mortals have? Well, going back to Mr Ferraro's letter, perhaps they should take notice, although I think a rail link would prove unlikely, due to the old cry, money. Perhaps our MP would prove his effectiveness and campaign our cause. What then can we then expect for the future? Traffic congestion through the main Ventnor Road and through Roxall all due to the failure to address the parked car issues, also lots of talking and spin, lots of expenditure on consultants, and lots of the government computer saying no to much needed money, and we all know how derisory the powers that be seem to think of the Isle of Wight and its problems. To round off, I ask where is the concern regarding increased pollution in Roxall caused by extra vehicle mileage to and from Ventnor? It really shows the government and council's green policies up for what they are, an excuse to make more money from the public. This goes to show how little regard the Ventnor area is given. Island Dill would have helped with council shortfall by Hans Bromwich Coes. May I thank the County Press for printing Bob Seeley's reply to my recent letter. It's great that the County Press is allowing some political debate in its letter pages ahead of the forthcoming general election and that our MP Bob Seeley is engaging. Let's start with what we know. We know that Bob Seeley campaigned enthusiastically during the last general election on delivering the Island Deal, along with wishing to be respected for the substance of what you do. The Island Deal, 6.4 million a year, was independently calculated by academics at the University of Portsmouth as being the additional funding required to deliver services on the island equal to those on the mainland. Mr Seeley has failed to deliver the island deal, fact. The island deal would have netted the Isle of Wight Council in excess of £30 million, interestingly similar to the Council's declared shortfall in revenue. It would have undoubtedly secured better services and who knows, possibly even a reduction in Council tax. Bob talks about a £175 million capital investment being made on the island, which is excellent news. What I would like to know, and I guess many County Press readers would like to know is, how much of this £175 million capital investment was secured by Mr Seeley personally? The substance of what you do. Hopefully, this is a fair question which Mr Seeley can answer in a detailed and unambiguous way without the political spin. 111 is first class from Sylvia Dolman of Lake. Dear Editor, I had been in pain all night, rang 111 at 7.30am and was answered in five minutes. I was asked a lot of questions and was told a medical practitioner would ring back within the hour. 
I waited ten minutes and she rang me. After explaining my problem, she said come straight to urgent care at St Mary's Hospital. I was seen in ten minutes, given two lots of strong painkillers and other medication and a cup of tea and biscuits to take them with by the actual doctor. I wasn't rushed, she was with me for half an hour. What a brilliant service, really couldn't fault any of it. I'd be interested to know if other people have experienced the same excellent service. Ideas on how to improve shopping in the town by Paul Denslow, Shankland Jewellers. I'm a shop owner in Shankland and I have an idea on how to improve the town shopping. My proposal is pedestrianisation of Regent Street from Boots Corner to the crossroads, plant trees, install block paving with seating and the cafes already there providing outside seating for refreshments, continental style. This would make for a much more pleasant shopping environment, encourage shoppers and would be much safer for the public. How someone has not been knocked down recently, I'll never know. The speed cars go through. There would be a loss of 20 parking spaces, which is negligible when you consider the car park is often empty. I would also ask that the shopper's car park is free for the first hour to encourage pop-in, pop-out shoppers. I feel very strongly about this. The town is part of our social structure and it's very important the shops left should remain and new good shops should be encouraged to open. On a personal level, my shop gets so dirty from traffic pollution particle, particles in the air, it causes myself and my sta staff breathing problems. Another idea I have is VAT should be cut to 10% for retail sales made from actual shops to give them a chance to compete with the internet. I hope others will also take up my crusade to save Shanklin shops before it's too late like some other towns on the island. Change needed from Jude Geddes of Sandown. Like so many people, I am desperate for a change of government. The Conservatives have shown themselves unable to conserve what matters most to the majority of the UK population. They have eroded environmental protections, created culture wars that make vulnerable members of our society into political punch bags, abandoned the NHS to crisis, and the Tory politics of division has left the country so deeply divided that I worry for our future. We all deserve much better. For this reason I've found hope in the form of the East-White primary process whose volunteers believe positive change can happen if we work together. It's been a joy meeting like-minded people who all want an MP who works with them and for them. It's time for change in the form of a progressive MP. East White Primary offers a chance to bring that to fruition. It's goodbye from Mary. And it's goodbye from John. The BBC in Touch programme follows. There is no scaffolding news this week. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Good evening. Vision rehabilitation is a forgotten, under-resourced system lost among the many pressures facing local authorities. Not my words, but those of the latest in a series of RNIB reports which, for the past 20 years or so, have been tracking what it sees as a serious decline in the help given to newly visually impaired people to learn the many skills which can help them cope with this very major change in their lives. Things such as moving around safely, running a house, learning about the technologies which have been revolutionising the way visually impaired people communicate. The report says people are now often waiting months, sometimes years, for the professional help which should be available to them by law. Well, tonight we want to examine the report's findings but go beyond that to discuss what can be done to change the situation and to look at what alternatives there might be if local authorities are no longer in a position financially to offer this help. 
Let's hear first from David Aldwinkle from the RNIB. David, tell us a bit more about the report. How did you conduct it and what did you find? This report, Out of Sight, was based on a freedom of information request to local authorities in England and some work speaking to more than 400 blind and partially sighted people showed that there are thousands of people who either aren't getting the support that they're entitled to, and remember this is a a legal entitlement, in a timely manner, i.e. within 28 days of diagnosis, or sometimes actually not getting it at all. And we found that nearly half of the people we spoke to weren't getting the help they needed in their lifetime at all. I mean, it sounds as if you think this is getting worse. The whole situation within the system we would anticipate is getting worse. But I think that's primarily really driven by the pressures that are on local authorities. But what doesn't kind of help the situation is that over those years, we haven't really stopped vision rehabilitation becoming that forgotten service that you referenced at the top of the programme, Peter. And you know, without better oversight nationally, it's going to be allowed to carry on. You know, There's huge variation across the country with some local authorities actually doing well. We have to recognise that. And then you know, variation depending on where you live, ranging from 86% of councils said that people were waiting more than the, the recommended 28 days. But there was within that a quarter of councils said that people were waiting over a year. And that's really, really unacceptable in our view. Was that waiting for over a year for assessment or to get some kind of rehabilitation? That that was waiting for more than a year to get an assessment. So Uh, that after the assessment, then you have another wait in order to get rehabilitation, presumably. We think kind of the, the help follows reasonably well after the assessment, but it's getting to that point, which is the real challenge. It's the only area of social care really that isn't regulated and doesn't therefore fall under an inspection regime. We think that could be a very straightforward step to making things better. Well David we'll come back to you on this and the solutions but first of all what does this mean to those who are waiting patiently some of them impatiently, for this help. We're joined by Eloise McBingham. Eloise is 21. She's based in Wigan. Tell us your situation and what kind of help you need. I'm a mother of a one-year-old and I'm currently struggling with sight loss, retinous pigmentosa. I'm struggling going out and being myself that I used to be. I can't do things that I used to do. And it's quite hard. It not just affects me, it affects people around me too. Because it's putting a lot of stress on my friends, my family. What have the delays been like? It's been quite traumatic because I've had eye surgery about five days ago. So I'm currently fully blind. I can't see nothing. I've been waiting for the health assessment at home being able to move around my home safely. Can I ask you, how difficult is it to know actually who to contact? Because it's quite a complicated system, isn't it? You know, you've got health, you've got social care. How difficult is it for you to know who to nag? It is quite difficult. You ring all over the places and people tell you to go to certain people and then you get pushed back and then you have to get sent to other people. So it's been quite a ball game to get to the right point. And can I just ask, what does your local authority say to you when you try to speed things up? That there's a waiting list of a year and a half. That they have said that they are going to try and put me through as an emergency. This was about eight months ago when they said they were going to put me through as an emergency. And as far as yet, I haven't heard anything but... Well, you may now. Um, Eloise, um, thanks very much. We have heard from Wigan Council and we've talked to them. There is a bit of a discrepancy about people's idea of the timescales here, but they say Wigan Council's sensory service team immediately contacts any residents who are referred into them for vision rehabilitation to discuss what options are available. Unfortunately, we also acknowledge that due to increasing demand for services and limited resources in the local government sector, waiting lists for assessments, which are administered using a priority needs system, can be a number of weeks. This is a situation, they say, which is not isolated to Wigan Borough. Nationally, there is a shortage of rehabilitation officers for visual impairment. Just quickly, Eloise, what's next for you what's the next step that you want to take to try and get the assessment done so i could go out and be able to take my daughter to the park and 
just feel like I'm the old person that I used to be and it'll give me more confidence and hopefully it'll open the eyes to other people that there is a long waiting list but it is worth waiting for. Eloise, thanks very much for joining us. Someone else who's experienced delays in getting the help they need is Bethany Brown. Bethany did get some initial assistance after her original diagnosis from a ROVI, that's a rehabilitation officer, but after her sight deteriorated further, that's when the delays occurred. I went from being partially sighted to severely sighted impaired. It meant that I needed to get re-referred. I was hoping for support with living independently, so how to use cookers, use microwaves, wondering if I needed any stair rails and stuff like that. I'm moving out of my mum's house, so at the moment I know where everything is, but if I lived independently, I wouldn't have that. The social worker had made a referral in May, and I have now got a support worker or a RAVI worker in um, March. So that means you had to wait about 10 months? Yeah. It was important for me because I wanted the support before I'd moved out. I wanted to ensure that I had the support and I knew exactly what support needs I need to let private landlords know. On top of that, I would want to know that I'm confident enough to live independently. But I understand that there's a big demand, but I never thought that I'd be waiting this long. That's uh, Bethany Brown. So what about the rehab workers themselves? Well, Simon Labbett is uh, chair of Rehab Workers Professional Network, which uh, represents this profession, and uh, he's a rehab officer himself with a local authority. Simon, first of all, because there's obviously a lot of confusion here, what's the correct sequence of events? You know, what are the steps that should happen and the sort of length of time that should be involved? OK, well, when initial contact is made by the individual themselves or the certificate of vision impairment is received, they should have an initial contact within two or three days just to acknowledge that. And then it is screened by someone who should have the relevant knowledge and experience to either ask the person directly what they'd like to have happen or if they're not so sure to coax out the answers. So that's the initial screening. And then that goes to an initial assessment where you go face to face with someone. And that should happen within 28 days. And that initial assessment is face to face. So you can pick up on any communication issues or spot any things in the domestic environment that may be difficult for someone. And at that point, you would identify the need for rehabilitation or not. And then you can then process that and have a rehabilitation programme. So how surprised are you by the kind of weights that um, Bethany and Eloise are talking about, allowing for the fact that there's some disagreement between the subjects and the local authorities, which I suspect is as much due to what um, Eloise was saying about not knowing who you're supposed to talk to? Yeah, if you don't know where to start off, the initial contact point is often staffed by someone outside of a sensory network or, or without sensory experience. So you're talking to someone who's very got very generic experience and it may be very hard to articulate exactly what it is you want. If you say, I would like some vision rehabilitation, there's a fair chance the person in the initial contact point won't know what that is anyway. Really? Yeah. Just because they don't know about visual impairment very much? Yeah, well, you can find some... Maybe some directors who don't know they have a vision rehabilitation service. <laughs> That's fairly shocking. Um, do you accept the findings of this report? I accept the findings of the report. I certainly do. And I, I, I'm glad they've been reiterated. I think reiterated is the word. Where do we go next is, yeah. is the point. We'll, we'll come on to that. Can I ask you, though, is this just about money? Wigan referred to lack of qualified rehab officers. Well, it does come down to money because there are a lack of qualified vision rehabilitation specialists, as in lots of social care and health professionals in ageing population and people retire. So if new ones aren't coming through, posts aren't being filled and we know posts aren't being filled. So that accounts for the waiting times. There are not enough people there to fulfil the jobs. That's a matter of money. That's a matter of a local authority investing in that service. So what about 
the alternatives for visually impaired people if their local authority is unable or very slow to help. I want to bring in Andy Fisher on this. Andy's worked in both the public and the private sector. Andy, is there a private sector? Are there alternatives? Because we tend to make the assumption that everybody's broke. But I suppose if you were desperate and you could afford it, is there anywhere else you could go? There is a private sector, but likewise, within the private sector, there are recruitment issues. What would you be looking there? Uh, Freelance? I mean, guide dogs do offer some rehab, but they would agree that that is for people who are specifically using their service, isn't it? As I understand it, that is correct, yeah. Yeah. But I know there are several organisations, and I believe guide dogs used to do contracting for local authorities as well. There are a number of, for example, local societies or in the voluntary sector that work as agents and work on contract to local authority as well. I mean, I've run a business providing private rehab previously before COVID. We provided contract rehab workers. We've provided specialist assessment on spot contracting as well. Even working with people with personalised payments or direct payments, as they used to be known as, where people buy in their own services and can buy private rehab may be and has been an option before and maybe an option going forward as well. Yeah. well I think though Simon, yes. in, in England the apprenticeship standard, it is basically government money provided to local authorities or their agents to use as they see fit. And one of the few success stories in this whole saga is vision rehabilitation training being an apprenticeship standard and a number of local authorities and employers like guide dogs use apprenticeships. So that is a route. The difficulty is getting local authorities to explore that route. Why are they reluctant to do so? That's not clear. I suspect they may be not sure it exists in the first place. And this is where we come back to the the idea of the voluntary sector, the, the sight loss sector, engaging much more with local government than they have done previously. Right. Now, we did ask for the uh, Minister for Social Care to come on to the programme to talk to us about this. The department said they were afraid nobody was available for interview. They did send us this statement. Local authorities are responsible for assessing the care needs of individuals with sight loss and commissioning services to support people with rehabilitation. The department welcomed the publication of the RNIB's Eye Care Support Pathway, NHS England contributed to its development and has offered to support its dissemination to eye care commissioners and providers. We also approached the Local Government Association, which uh, represents local authorities, as you might guess. They didn't have anyone available to be interviewed either, but their social care spokesperson told us... Adult social care services have faced chronic underfunding for many years, but councils do their best for communities with the resources they have. This report shows the impact of not having adequate funding, staffing or support needed to provide the services people require to live equal lives. It is disappointing and concerning that the budget provided no new investment for adult social care. Vision rehabilitation services must be fully funded in order to enable people to live full and independent lives. So it's going to seem, isn't it, to people like Eloise and Bethany as if everyone is blaming everyone else. I want to bring David back in this. David, I mean, the RNIB is calling for action. Could that action or some of that action not come from the RNIB itself? I mean, the RNIB used to provide rehabilitation to residential rehab centres, for instance, where people could go for extended rehab courses. Haven't we reached the point, listening to this frustrating conversation, where the organisation perhaps should provide the help itself rather than telling other people what they ought to do? It's a fair question. I think we have to look at a lot of the services that RNIB does provide, you know, including the ECLO and Living Well with Sight Loss, which are trying to fill some of the gaps and trying to solve some of these problems. We do have to remember that this is a legal obligation on local authorities, and I think it would be remiss to simply say charitable funding has to be used to take the government off the hook. But that's not to say that we shouldn't be part of the solution. There's an old adage that says, if you don't measure it, people don't think it matters. And I think the final point I'd I'd say is that RNIB, as you heard in the health ministry's statement, has launched the eye 
care pathway, but we need to go further than that. And we are looking to work with stakeholders, including Simon and his, his great team and local authorities and government and potential funding bodies to try and find what could be a long-term sustainable solution to this. If we don't take that approach, I'm afraid we will just really be continuing to put sticking plasters on, which is what we've done for a, a number of years. You know, RNIB mm. guide lots right. of organisations. Well, let me therefore just go quickly back to Andy and Simon. Andy, you've worked in this field, you've worked in various parts of it. What do you think is the long-term answer to this? It's probably what Simon alluded to earlier. Funding is obviously definitely an issue. We need more training places to feed more specialists through the system as well and also as well the thing about registration about career pathways for professional staff as well is really important and also pay grades as well again i know it's all money related but yeah. it all does connect and we want people to have a career in rehab it is a wonderful career it's a great job and we want people to work in the career for as long as possible but it's a multi pronged approach really it's not just throwing money at it but also including all sectors i think we all need to work collaboratively in partnership and it is involving obviously health professionals more joined up with uh, social care but also like i've been alluding to as well the private sector does have a role to play really i've got to say I'm, I'm not convinced about this link with health it's not working i think this integrated care board right. thing is a really good idea but mm. when it comes to eyes ophthalmology and optometry are very dominant they're not particularly interested in rehabilitation the funding doesn't lie with them the funding for rehabilitation lies with local government the sector has to speak the language of local government and understand what their pressures are and look at how services are commissioned with local government i just don't think the icb route is the way to go at the moment well there's obviously much more to be talked about there and we would be very interested in people's reactions Andy Fisher, Simon Labette, David uh, Aldwinkle, Eloise and Bethany thank you all very much indeed. Before we go next week we're going to be looking at the disabled students allowance as there have been some changes to how people will receive financial help towards their specialist equipment, support workers etc. We'd very much like to hear from people who've used the service particularly people who are either applying now or are already at university. You can email in touch at bbc.co.uk you can leave us a voice mail on 0161 836 1338 or go to our website bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch for me peter white producer beth hemmings and studio manager jack morris goodbye